so many webinars going on. Uh, we are grateful that you've been able to find time for this. So given the topic, I will focus more around the personal data protection bill and how it impacts cloud and telecom service providers. But I'll probably be talking a little more on cloud because we from NASCOM and DSCI engage a lot more deeply with the cloud service providers. Whereas uh, we do engage with telecom service providers, but I would say we engage a little more with cloud and the entire solution provider ecosystem, which rides on top of the cloud. Uh, before we get into the specific impact of the provisions of the bill, uh, the important thing to remember is any business or any government or state government, private sector, large corporate, global companies, startup, when they're looking at a cloud platform, they're actually looking at a business solution or a workload moving to the cloud. They don't really get bogged down by what elements of data am I putting on the cloud because that is secondary to a cloud migration decision. So it's always a workload that is being decided whether it is mission critical, whether it can move to the cloud, should it be on a public cloud, should it be on hybrid. So we should always have a legislative regime which is enabling cloud adoption because I think it's no brainer. All of us will agree that cloud has significantly enabled the digitization journey of several enterprises, several government agencies, particularly small, small and medium businesses, startups, SaaS, new league of SaaS providers who are not only able to serve the market in which they work from, but they're able to serve global markets because they're offering their service or their startup is enabling their product on a cloud platform. So it's important to remember the solution provider ecosystem and the business user is going the cloud way based on some fundamental business reasons anywhere 24 by 7 online services and being able to uh, offer those services to various jobs that's one important point to keep in mind second i think uh, it is not an overstatement to say that a combination of global telecom companies and telecom companies in india plus cloud service providers including indian cloud service providers global service providers have significantly accelerated the digitization journey of any enterprise, any vertical public sector, private sector agencies. So there is no doubt that cloud is fast tracking digitization, including in the post COVID world, you read any uh, you know, post COVID research reports from the big strategy measures, whether it is a McKinsey, whether it is a BCG or any one of them who might have been you know, tracking more closely in the last three, four months or NASCOM's and DSCI's own assessment, I think the overall cloud adoption is going to get accelerated in the post-COVID world because a lot of new verticals who were traditionally laggards in adopting emerging technologies are now going the whole of virtual mode. Or bodies like UGC are looking at what is the long-term strategy for online and virtual delivery. So cloud is a way to go and cloud is going to accelerate adoption. Now coming to the PDP bill before I look at the impact of certain provisions and is it going to negatively or positively impact and overall a privacy and data protection legislation for which DSCI has been batting for many years, even before the APSHA committee was constituted is that a data protection legislation and a strong protection authority who's going to define the codes of practices is going to look at uh, you know, enforcing it, making sure that businesses are more responsible in respecting the privacy of their consumers and protecting their data uh, is something that is needed even for the, uh, the overall digital India journey or the harnessing the potential of the digital economy. Because I think a strong data protection legislation, A, will reinforce trust of the consumers that the enterprise to with whom or the service provider to whom they're offering their personal sensitive data is going to use it more responsibly, is not going to misuse or unreasonably monetize it or unreasonably share it with third parties. It will reinforce trust of the consumer and the citizen because of which I think they will leverage digital uh, in a more uh, proactive way. Similarly, it will also ensure that businesses are investing 
making the right investments right from a management perspective and a technology stack perspective in enforcing security data protection and privacy so that uh, once there is a legislation and there is a, a strong regulator compliance always drives a certain enterprise business behavior and initially the compliance itself will make sure that the maturity of businesses in the kind of data protection privacy practices they adopt is done so overall i think there is no debate that india needs a data protection regime to be able to and making sure that businesses move up the maturity curve in their data protection and privacy practices now coming to the uh, specific uh, provisions of the bill and our assessment of how it's going to impact uh, we have not done a specific impact assessment but i will try to apply some of the assessments we have done to a cloud service provider i think the overall uh, having an independent data protection authority uh, codes of practice all of, and privacy by design principles i think are very reassuring provisions but uh, some of the challenges i foresee for most uh, fiduciaries or data controllers and processors which could be even a system integration or a services company but these problems get amplified for a telecom service provider and particularly a cloud service provider and here i think the problem is not whether you are an indian cloud service provider or a global i think these problems are universal first anybody who's betting them themselves on migrating to the cloud and if i am a cloud service provider or my company is a cloud service provider we uh, they will we will expect Uh, some kind of predictability and regulation uh, the, the entire regulatory regime what is it's predictable because you have to make those decisions when you make those investments the biggest challenge here is the way the entire data taxonomy and classification is defined and the ambiguity around what is sensitive personal data and that new league of sensitive i mean uh, new sen uh, sensitive personal data uh, new classifications can come up at uh, not even by the authority but by government and that uh, anything can be declared as uh, critical personal data is one big challenge because when a workload is migrated to the cloud the cloud service provider has certain uh, responsibilities to its customers and if this is a moving uh, phenomenon it's extremely it's going to be very difficult because there is a mandate to localize the data typically a cloud provider will not look at where the data is the location of the data they will decide where their data centers are based on quality of power based on the talent requirement based on their market and their business decisions right here you have to make a decision uh, on uh, forget looking at the workload but you'll have to go down granular to the data perspective and then decide what needs to be stored in india and what needs to be stored in any other uh geography that they choose to place their data centers in this is a big problem for any cloud service provider and the fact that uh, once you have probably done all this implementation taking at the provisions of the bill as they stand whenever it gets enacted and if 6 months down the line one year down the line if uh, what, what classifies as sensitive personal data and what classifies as critical personal data uh, keeps changing without you know predictability in terms of timelines or the parameters on which these decisions are going to be made it's going to be a problem not just for the cloud provider but all the customers all their customers or all the businesses who have migrated to the cloud i i see that as the big problem the second uh, problem is the broad classification of what is sensitive personal data including the entire health and financial stack will significantly impact cloud adoption by the health sector and financial sector uh, already we believe that while there was a very good uptick of uh, cloud uh, momentum or adoption momentum in india several businesses moving to the cloud uh, across verticals uh, some regulations from regulators like rbi have already put a halt on uh, cloud uh, rfps the uh, decisions to look at some workloads moving to the cloud even in the banking sector the moment the, this draft bill came up and then the new version with some changes was tabled in parliament we are beginning to see a lot of slow down of cloud procurement decisions or cloud rfps because there is not clarity they're saying let the bill come let's have complete clarity 
before we decide on the cloud. It would be a pity if the data protection, instead of accelerating uh, and enabling a trusted milieu for consumers to move to a solution on the cloud, if it's going to actually slow down cloud, because I believe that unless we move down the cloud, a broad digital adoption in some of the laggard sectors in small and medium, micro small enterprises, healthcare, education, uh, both K-12 and higher is going to be significantly impacted. The second big problem I see is uh, which it's not, uh, to be honest, it's not just the cloud service providers. Even when we talk to our classic services companies, whether it's Infosys, Wipro, TCS, or co constituents of NASCOM membership, uh, the, uh, the lack of clear carving out of data controller and the data processor and differentiating the obligations of the controller and the processor uh, is going to be uh, a big challenge. Uh, there would be worries in taking contracts from customers because I think any provider, cloud provider, all the more because at any point of time they are uh, servicing hundreds of customers and also broadly the service provider, uh, the IT services provider ecosystem. Unless the data controller and the processor obligations and roles and it's uh, ring fenced and earmarked there is going to be a big problem because there could be a tendency for a data fiduciary because of the customer contracting and the customer, the power that a customer wields to be able to transition a lot of the obligations of the bill to the provider. And for a cloud provider, this would uh, be a big disaster for, uh, I mean, to be able to move more customers to the cloud. So I think there should be clear clarity because in a lot of things, the data protection regime obligation should be on the fiduciary with necessary uh, obligations from the processor to whom they may be outsourcing their services and data processing and data sharing. The second uh, challenge I would see in this entire thing is uh, data protection authority being completely independent and having a process of consulting with the industry members with the sectoral uh, players, maybe the sectoral uh, regulators in being able to decide uh, what if tomorrow for some reason the Indian Data Protection Authority needs to declare some additional data as sensitive personal data or control data. And the second uh, challenge I see, the, another big challenge that I see for cloud providers, because the entire cloud provider ecosystem is, it is a global play for them. Even I am aware of a big cloud provider from my hometown, Hyderabad, who's now opening data centers in other geographies. They have more customers outside of India than in India. Okay, uh, Increasingly, they're able to move a lot of their SMB customers in Middle East, South Southeast Asia, ASEAN countries onto their cloud platform. So, in, uh, so for any cloud provider, data flows and predictability of what the regulation is in terms of transferring data, storage of data, for how many years can they retain the data? Uh, the redundancy that they need to build in so that the resiliency and availability is built in. And there are a lot of ambiguous provisions in this bill which would worry any cloud provider. Uh, the next new thing which is was not there in the version of the bill uh, that the committee in which I was uh, you know, released or uh, gave it to Meti compared to the version that is now tabled in parliament creeping in of the non-personal data because this entire bill was about personal data. And now having a provision uh, on non-personal data sharing and saying that it is not only the data controllers, but even the data process, putting an obligation on the data processors to share. If this provision goes live, I think every data processor, whether it's cloud or whether it's a regular services company is going to uh, contravening most of the contracts they sign because there's no cloud provider or a processor can just share the data and all the more personal or sensitive data with anybody unless there are checks and balances and there is a law enforcement regime and there are a proven case of uh, a crime or a fraud which needs to be investigated. So just saying that first of all non-personal data uh, should not be the remit of this bill and just having 
a new revision has taken uh, NASCOM and DSA and me personally by surprise because it was never there in the bill. Similarly, I think uh, we need a little more clarity, which probably may not be in the bill. It might more be when you know the bill is enacted and the data protection authority is regulated. I think what is the obligations when there is a breach notification? What is the obligations on the processor and the cloud service provider versus the data fiduciary? It needs a lot more clarity because otherwise I think it would be an intimidating burden for any cloud service provider to operate in India. So broadly, I would say these are the provisions of the bill uh, which uh, worry me and we should worry any cloud service provider, which will also worry any data fiduciary or controller, which is making the right decision to migrate to the cloud so that uh, they have a more agile IT infrastructure, they have better availability and uh, they you know, probably are also optimizing their infrastructure costs by minimizing on-prem investments, which can get obsolete very fast. So Nikhil, broadly, this is what I wanted to cover in my opening. Rama, uh, just to take off from there, what, do you have any particular concerns regarding adequacy uh, with the GDPR? Do you think that the bill in its current form will uh, allow us to meet adequacy requirements? Uh, with the EU? Uh, I mean, this is not specific to a cloud service provider. It's a broader discussion, what? which is, I think, uh, I, I mean, there are some uh, loose ends. We cannot say that this bill automatically meets the adequacy requirements of EU GDPR. One of them could be, you know, this mandate for uh, uh, local storage of data and what is sensitive and what is personal. And uh, there is definitely some loosens there. We cannot say that adequacy with the UGDPR will automatically be guaranteed. Similarly, what are the bilateral, multilateral arrangements to facilitate easier cross-border data flows? Because if for everything, if a business and a cloud provider needs to get consent from the Data Protection Authority, uh, that would be a very, it would be a big roadblock. So how can, even once the bill is passed, what is the bilateral, multilateral, and data transfer cooperation agreements. I think all of this, uh, we still have to see how that's going to be. And, and just in terms of cross-border, like how does, um, how does portability play in all of this in the sense, uh, if a user's data is stored in a jurisdiction, if it's not sensitive personal data, but it's stored in another jurisdiction, how does the portability requirement play out um, you know, with different with data being stored in different jurisdictions? Yes. And does it put any particular burden uh, on cloud service providers? Um, yes, and how can because be right now, I think the problem stems from the fact that uh, there is no crystal clarity on the data classification. And there is this all enabling clause that something can be declared uh, critical and a new league of data, a new set of data can be considered as sensitive. Because of which, when they are transferring, because right now, let us assume personal data can be transferred and they, they decide to uh, store it outside the borders of the country in some data center of their choice, right? If this is um, uh, something that is not clearly determined when they start this journey, at least for a certain reasonable time frame. How do they ensure when it is transferred and what is the portability, whether those agreements are in place between those uh, geographies is a big problem. Okay. Uh, so one, one more uh, thing, just like the non-personal data I talked about, uh, because it came in in this version which got tabled in parliament, one point I missed, if you allow me, is this entire thing where a right to be forgotten now as a completely new implication in the version that has been tabled in parliament because uh, there is a right to erasure and uh, uh, implementing right to erasure uh, is a problem for any fiduciary and the processor. I think it's a bigger problem for a cloud. Okay, uh, just uh, there's a question uh, from an anonymous attendee asking about what is the example of non-personal data that you mentioned was creeping in. Yeah, there is a pro new provision that has been included that non-personal data can also, uh, I mean, the government can ask any data fiduciary or data processor to share 
even non personal data in case uh, you know government uh, deems fit so non personal data could be anything which is definitely not personally identifiable data it could be anonymized data it could be business confidential information pertaining to the enterprise which is not personal data so this provision has come in i don't remember the section of and but this got right you know it just crept in into the version that got tabled in parliament okay there is another question from samya tiwari who is asking about I think we have lost Nikhil for a second there. So I'll just read out the question that Soumya has sent. Uh, what would be the liability between data fiduciary and uh, data fiduciary slash controller and cloud providers emanating from the contract between them? It would always be there, even if the PDP bill fastens liability only on the data fiduciary. Yeah, because uh, can I ask that, Aditi? Yes, yes, ma'am, please. Yeah. so i mean when it comes to personal data and the data protection regime i think the buck stops with the data controller and the fiduciary and based on the obligations that the uh, law places on the data controller and fiduciary they would be uh, passing on the necessary obligations on the processor through the contracts so the processor is always accountable to the fiduciary uh, through the contract that they sign and it applies whether you are a service provider or a cloud service provider it's not that the cloud service provider is directly responsible to the consumer for their remedies or is directly responsible for uh, to the uh, uh, regulator for example if there is a data protection breach right obviously the controller would have put the necessary obligations on the right for investments in security making sure that all risks are mitigated as much as possible the security controls and the privacy controls are in place and even with all the best of efforts if there was a breach then the processor is obviously accountable to the controller with whom they have a contract right uh then we have an another question from arijit His question is: Should data be a part of a trade deal instead of an independent or country zone required norm? And if this is a valid idea, then how will it impact the uh, personal data protection bill? I'm not very sure. I get the question. I think the data should be part of a trade deal. Yes, because uh, under sections 36 and 37, which deal with cross-border data flows, the idea is that you create special intra-group schemes. Yeah. or consortia to deal with data flow so his yeah. question i think is that whether it should be part of a trade deal yes i mean uh, typically for example there are discussions that are going on even when eu gdpr was uh, getting framed and even before it went live uh, there are discussions between let's say department of commerce and ministry of it and their corresponding bodies in eu to see how do we facilitate cross border data flows so there would always be some bilateral multilateral arrangements in place so that uh, as part of the trade exchange between those two geographies data also plays a role and you are facilitating so that every time there is no regulatory burden similarly probably now as we move forward the, there is a provision in the bill which enables that you know green lighting uh, data corridor so that there can be automatic data transfers so that for a particular sector or for a particular uh, country to country right maybe we can have something where all financial data between these two countries are automatically green lighted so all these arrangements need to be negotiated and closed surely it can be part of a broader bilateral multilateral cooperation and data cooperation is one very important thing right uh, we have another question from neharika Uh, which is is right to be forgotten preferred over right to erasure is the right to be forgotten easier to implement for data fiduciaries especially when data is shared with third parties under certain conditions so first of all when we did a survey of uh, our members when you i think on the first year of eu gdpr right to be forgotten was called out as the most difficult to implement i am not even going to right to erasure right to be forgotten itself was declared was you know 
uh, shared to us as one of the most difficult to implement both for the processor and the controller. Mm -hmm. The right to delay, typically when you say right to be forgotten, it is almost involves that you don't do further processing of that data, right? And that is the obligation that you have to your consumer. But the moment you say right to deletion, getting all instances of where that data resides, right? Mm -hmm. And making sure that it gets deleted, it's, it's a problem for the controller. It's a bigger problem for the cloud provider. So right to erasure has taken uh, most of the industry by surprise, which is the current version that is in, uh, that's been tabled in Palm. Right. Uh, we have a question from Ram, which is as a uh, software as a service provider, uh, how important uh, is it to have a geo redundant backup for a disaster recovery plan? Would that mean that now with the new personal data protection bill, any disaster recovery backup with the personal data should also stay within the country? Yes, I mean, broadly, I think whenever NASCOM and DSCI talks about, I mean, we have, we've been strong advocates against localization, right? One of the biggest challenges is, you know, how do you implement uh, true disaster recovery business continuity planning? Because sometimes it could just be a breach to you know the power lines of a country which could bring down even at a country level it could also be a natural disaster let us say even if the business has chosen a couple of locations within india there could be uh, a situation of could it could even be a cyber emergency situation cyber emergency situation or it could be a natural disaster situation right, right. for example so, so many of our data center providers have had this challenge where uh, they've had uh, data centers or security operation centers in two locations in India, and both of them have had very severe containment uh, restrictions during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So it is going to impact, and ideally, we should not have this constraint of localization. I've been batting against it. Right, I understand. Uh, we'll take the last two questions. One is from Abhijit. Uh, which is, I think it was partially answered in your keynote address as well, that will section 91 also mandate cloud service providers to share the data of their customers, that is the data fiduciary in this case, uh, with the government. And that might not always be possible because uh, most of the customers encrypt their data. And in such a situation, any cloud service provider would not have visibility into the data. See, the current bill and that provision is worrying precisely because of this reason. I talked about it. Because mm -hmm. no cloud provider or the processor can have a unilateral right to process data. It belongs to the controller. The, the controller should be made accountable for that. First of all, uh, having this blanket provision that government can ask for any data, including non-personal data, is a very worrying clause. It's a bigger worry for the cloud service provider. I hope that because if most cloud providers don't really have access to the data. Mm -hmm. I do hope that some wisdom will prevail and this provision gets known. Right. Uh, then one last question. Uh, I mean, we have more questions. It's just that's all we have time for. Uh, given the review of the impact of GDPR and since the personal data protection bill builds on the GDPR framework, what are some of the red flags that need to be addressed in the current version? And are there efforts to harmonize definitions, classification of data uh, for adequacy reasons? So some discussions keep going on. For example, we have submitted to Department of Commerce when the bill came out from the committee itself on what are the differences and nuances between EU GDPR and the version of the data protection bill that the committee released. Uh, so there are discussions that are going on. But right now, I think the focus is on the bill and harmonizing the bill with other regimes. While there were discussions in the past, I presume Department of Commerce is going to accelerate those discussions and make sure that there is some harmonization and adequacy decisions that are pushed for. But right now, uh, there are definitely some differences between the two. So the adequacy uh, requirements, uh, so harmonization across regions would happen via the uh, Department of Commerce instead of METI? No, METI is also involved, but a lot of these trade dialogues in India and uh, discussions between various geographies 
overall, whether it's on the services side, goods side, or on the data side, are uh, driven by Department of Commerce, it doesn't mean uh, Meiji is not involved. So okay. I'm sure both those ministries will be involved. But uh, significant discussions with EU GDPR and you know, making India adequate for that prior to the PDP bill were led by department. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, addressing everyone today. It was great to have you on board and I think all of us learned about the challenges associated with the bill. I'll hand thank over you. to Nikhil now. Thank you, Aditi, and thank you, Nikhil. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amar. So, uh, I'm sorry I had a bit of a connectivity issue with a power cut, my broadband stopped working and I guess that also happens, uh, even if my daughter was. Um, we have, uh, we'll move to the panel now and I think one of, uh, we're very pleased to have with us Tarun Dua, the uh, co-founder of E2E Networks, who's also a CTO. Um, and, uh, you know, he's someone who understands the cloud business really well. Uh, Tarun, uh, you know, for most of us, cloud means storage because that's what we've sort of seen over, uh, growing up with the internet that, and even if you're hosting a website, it was just storage of, um, uh, right, right. of, of data so, and running a site. So, how has the cloud business changed? What's, sure, what, sure. And how is it different from what we imagine it to be? Sure. Uh, thank you, Nikhil, uh, for the great introduction. Uh, uh, so as uh, uh, Rama mentioned that cloud is no longer about data, cloud is about workloads. So when we say that like we are talking uh, in respect of a cloud and we talk in terms of uh, storage or space or hosting, like uh, those terms have become like uh, obsolete like 10 years back. So majorly uh, any cloud provider like us is concerned about like how do we run like particular types of workloads. Uh, we do not have access to customer data. Uh, like it may be uh, technically possible to access like unencrypted data, but typically like customers would ideally store any kind of like uh, sensitive data encrypted. So uh, typically a cloud provider cannot have access to the data. Now, uh, so my definition of like what a cloud provider is actually doing with uh, over here is that like uh, we are not only uh, storing the data, which is incidental to the whole cloud business that data has to be stored if it has to be processed because like data processing is happening on the cloud, but how exactly is the data processing happening? So typically, usually the customer is going to bring in uh, his own code base or some licensed code base, some licensed software or the software built by themselves, uh, which is completely arbitrary. Uh, as far as the cloud operator is concerned, we don't know what sort of programming is there to process the data. And those programs are being run by the data fiduciaries uh, on the processing power that we have provided. Now, uh, mm. an example would be like you have your laptop. Right. So you bought your laptop from say Dell or HP or whoever. Now Dell or HP has no control over like what sort of data, whether it is uh, labeled as personal data, whether it is labeled as sensitive data to be brought onto that laptop and being processed over there by using software from any of the millions of uh, software providers or millions of open source software being available. So essentially like like uh, what a cloud is doing is providing a computing environment we hmm. have absolutely no control over like what data is wrong being brought in we have absolutely no control over what software is being run apart from the fact that like we uh, would facilitate our customers to be able to use the common uh, commercially acceptable open source software like whether it is centos or ubuntu uh, or debian kind of distributions of linux which are primarily used for processing, uh, running any kind of like compute environments. So like when you look at that and when you look at like data processor being mentioned at multiple places in the bill, along with the fact that like, uh, uh, any of the uh, offenses under these, uh, this act are like uh, non billable offenses and mm. your entire company is liable and responsible for this. So I like, I have my doubts about like how 
this is going to work in practice like uh, especially since uh, goodness cannot always be assumed in india at the lower levels of bureaucracy or law enforcement so i i would be very very worried over there so like uh, so course, like, this so so you are also providing so you basically providing processing infrastructure but you are not necessarily a processor is that what you think is that what you believe like uh, so, so how does it we are a processor because we do storage uh, right. like we store the and, data and we are and, actually and running a storage Tarun, do you think storage should be a part of the definition uh, i don't know how uh, else like uh, uh, see for example you are like a crm provider right hmm. now you are actually running your own code base and you are also storing the data so essentially storage has to be an essential part of like the definition but i think the differentiating factor for differentiating a cloud service provider has to be that uh, there is an ability to run uh, completely uh, arbitrary code or software uh, on the computing environment that allows for very arbitrary processing of the data and manipulation of the storage now this is what cloud computing providers allow so that's what differentiates a cloud computing provider from like a data fiduciary okay so i think this is a great segue to bring shweta in shweta uh, if you could put your uh, hi hi shweta hi so, hi uh, uh, so shweta uh, i mean salesforce by its uh, crm products also processes a lot of personal data so uh, what sort of uh, impact does the pdp bill have um, have on the business and uh, do you see yourself as a processor absolutely salesforce as uh, one of the largest cloud companies in the world is a data processor and that's how we would classify ourselves and uh, it's true as a company that really thrives on in on innovation nikhil it's very important for us to also work with governments closely to ensure that regulations that are being brought in are not just robust in terms of enhancing user uh, privacy and security because that remains key to our business when when we are working with customers and we put trust as our number one value but also those are regulations that are not in any way hampering uh, the overall economic growth and i think uh, it's very important that we bring in a post covid scenario when we talk about what's really going on because economic recovery has become very very important for countries and for companies and this is the time when companies and countries would like to use the efficiencies that the cloud system brings with it so there is a there is a certain amount of efficiency that is brought in by the cloud ecosystem which can be now harnessed at this point in time to ensure that we allow companies to recover faster and countries are also put on a high growth path so what we're seeing right now is that uh, we strongly believe that in the current context there is a need to reevaluate the current uh, personal data protection bill to make sure that we're not bringing in mandates you know whether it's a data localization mandate or any other mandate that in any way hamper economic growth or stifles innovation because technology has been put right in the center in this in this uh, post uh, in the current covid era and it'll it's in fact mm. a conversation that every government is having right now digital transformation how will technology help us emerge out of it and i'll quickly cite one report of the asia um, cloud computing association aca that actually ranks countries in apac because there's a lot of conversation around which country will benefit how will you recover out of the crisis and aca actually they have a cloud um, index cloud readiness index in which india is ranked actually uh, 10th out of 14 countries and that is a cause of worry that i think uh, india needs to now now think about and one of the main reasons is that if you bring in restrictions that stymie cross border data flows that itself is a reflection of the fact that you are not made for efficiencies that uh, cross border data flows bring in or the cloud ecosystem brings in so yes uh, talking more specifically and i don't want to take too much time because i know you have many other panelists but there are concerns around the personal data protection bill many of them rama has already highlighted but the ambiguity around the definition the classification that the government is bringing in first the very need for the for such a data localization mandate is it really enhancing user privacy and security or is it causing way more harm the ambiguity mm. around a number of definitions uh all of that coupled together i think there is time for a hard relook at uh, at this very very important piece of legislation that the government is looking at passing very soon so uh, shweta what sort of compliance concerns related concerns do you have 
let's say the bill hypothetically goes through in its current form uh, how will life change so uh, obviously as a as a large cloud co cloud computing company our main aim is to create a resilient efficient reliable uh, you know data management strategy for our customers that will be our main aim right to put in place an infrastructure that will be right for our customers and that's what we strive towards now obviously uh, we also have to comply with local regulations and any policies that are put in place is something that global companies like ours would obviously uh, comply with and, and be compliant at the same time i think it's important to understand the kind of practical challenges that will come in the way when you try and comply with some provisions for instance mm. to give an example uh, when there is absolute lack of clarity around what critical data could mean now when we are re-engineering our systems to comply with current laws how do you even factor in the uncertainty and the lack of predictability on something like this or as rama had mentioned the broad definition around sensitive personal data that is just way too broad for us to understand how the system is going to work and even when when there is a definition that talks about okay this data can be processed in india cannot be processed outside india but this category of data can be processed uh, outside but a copy needs to be stored here there's lack of clarity around what that copy means is it mirroring so when companies as large as ours are looking at complying with these with these um, privacy regimes that are coming in, I think number one, interoperability becomes very, very important. So the closer we are to accepted global regimes, the better it is for companies to adapt. Secondly, I think timelines become critical. So while we will all work towards compliance, it's very, very important that we have clarity and at least that two-year window uh, that GDPR had provided uh, for compliance to come through, because otherwise we're really going to be in, in a place where where we feel we'll rush through compliance and there will be challenges that will come on. I can go on and on, Nikhil, but there are practical challenges. And like I would like to highlight uh, whether it is around consent, whether it is around, uh, you know, number of other provisions. But if I would sum it up in a broad way, uh, predictability mm. and clarity right from the start is important, not wait for the rules to be notified. So you would like critical person data, for example, to be defined from the get go? Absolutely, absolutely. Because then we know what we're dealing with. Otherwise, uh, you know, just the just the entire uh, anxiety around the fact that there could be there could be additions and deletions, there could be changes, makes it very hard for companies that are putting in place large infrastructure plans and and working towards compliance of uh, of uh, large you know privacy legislations to work with. So we would want very very. So, like we want no room for changes and uh, you know we want complete predictability coming in and more clarity when we talk about those classifications or definitions on 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 what the government really means when it says storage when it says processing i think that kind of thing uh, if we believe that the parliamentary committee that's looking into the bill um, understands and we've obviously been engaging very actively and and we've helped them understand why this is very important for companies like ours to have clarity right up front I'm going to go back to Tarun with this one. Tarun, how easy is it or how complicated is it to re-engineer databases to mark specific types of data as different types of data? And, you know, what is uh, what role do cloud service providers play there? As someone uh, who primarily operates in the MSME space, uh, I, I would like to point out this fact that, like, uh, the per capita income of uh, European Union, which has GDPR like regulation and India is very, very different. The kind of technical skills that uh, businesses would be able to afford in the US or the Europe would be very, very different from the kind of technical talent that uh, is accessible to the Indian businesses. So like uh, uh, just as an example, we are talking about like re-architecting the databases to be able to uh, classify and then uh, potentially erase or forget data. Uh, for small Indian customers, but uh, right now, uh, the very same Indian customers, like numbering like uh, 62 million SME enterprises in India, like, uh, do we really think that they have access to uh, that kind of uh, programming talent or database management talent today? Uh, like, we would completely become dependent on uh, large multinational companies to be able to only do this for us. Like, uh, so any complicated regulation goes to the advantage of large multinational companies as opposed to uh, helping the small SME in India. So over here, I would feel that like uh, uh, onerous requirements, which are like a moving target, would be mm -hmm. to the determinant of the small MSME in India. 
so so do you think that uh, this technically yes impact... it's possible to do everything that the government is saying in its bill like everything hmm. is technically possible data replication is technically possible data deletion is technically possible not advisable uh, data forgetting technically possible uh, again like better than data erasure but uh, 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 kind of like data forgetting is like still uh, like problematic like from the so of course the exceptions has been made but where do those exceptions uh, end and like where do they uh, uh, so for example like uh, uh, gdpr uh, says that like uh, you can keep reasonable amount of data even after being asked for uh, to forget about that data now what is reasonable for us it could be that like look uh, you came in and launched certain machines uh, from a control panel uh, for me it's a reasonable data that needs to be stored uh, from the customer perspective or from the legal perspective whether that is defined or not uh, from the gst law perspective like i am obviously supposed to keep the uh, uh, some financial records of my customers whoever has come in how they have paid uh, whether they have paid through upi whether they have paid through credit card uh, so there is a lot of data that uh, a provider could feel or a data fiduciary could feel is that is critical for the uh, sanctity of their database for being able to uh, especially audit logs etc to be able to backtrack what a customer did uh, how did they interact with the systems uh, from the customer perspective uh, like they might want like all of those interactions to go away hmm. so they might want like that so uh, let's take the example of a, uh, a terrorist like uh, someone searches on uh, a search engine that how to make a bomb or how to make a nuclear bomb now uh, what is the search engine supposed to do in this case like so right to forget says that like whatever a person has searched needs to be deleted from a law enforcement perspective uh this might be something that uh, that particular search provider needs to store forever so so that's an that's where do you draw the line segue tarun that's an interesting segue tarun to go into telecom uh i'm going to ask anjali this anjali uh, how do you see this playing out in in the telecom space because at one level you have uh, your licensing conditions which they require you to store data at another level you have the the, the pdp bill which uh, has a right to erase and the right to be forgotten built into it so thanks nikhil um, i think i'm coming from it's like a relative perspectives so i am coming from a heavily regulated regime so for me when i'm looking at the data protection bill i am also looking for harmonization harmonization within sectors and i'm also looking for a certain amount of a practical and balanced approach the telecom sector is very heavily regulated we are told exactly what we have to store how much we have to store for how long we have to store but uh, for uh, you know us uh, i think the uh, sending of uh, data outside india the cross border transfer is one of the important aspects of the data protection bill and uh, while of course it has granulated it out to say personal sensitive personal and critical uh, personal so at very, least i would like is... to sorry anjali i am in, interjecting over here right so since we mentioned about cross border flows and some of the people have expressed uh, uh, i would say like opinions i am in consonance with that like uh, cross border flow of data should not be something that should be controlled by law uh, i am also opposed to that and the simple reason for that is that you are running a website you look at a typical website today there are something like 21 cookies from providers all over the world like it's not just a question of msmes in india but it's also a question of like being able to use any competitive msme throughout the world for example mailchimp uh, for instance may not have any storage in india i'm just taking a random example i do, i'm not aware whether they have any storage in india or not and uh, like the only thing that might be uh, shared from the perspective of a small msme in india who is a typical user of someone like mailchimp is that like i am sending out some emails now using mail merge like there could be like some uh, supposedly personal sensitive data that is leaked out in that email it could be the phone number it could be the email id it could be some other identifier of uh, information that goes out in the email now uh, 
on the cloud like obviously a machine has to be able to connect to the entire internet all over the world number 2 all those connections are going to be encrypted via ssl so as a cloud provider or as a telecom operator like you have no control over like essentially what a data fiduciary or a small website operator is doing with the data like see uh, each person is controlling only the data to which it is privy it i cannot control the data and practices of my customers or users as far as so, the are you going uh, to run google analytics concerned? for a small competitor of google analytics on a website i'm sorry are you going to be able is an msme msme going to be able to use a small msme competitor of google analytics without having to worry about like the personal data protection bill no i'm certainly not saying that all i'm saying is tarun harmonized approach the telecom sector right now is over regulated i have a clause in my license which says i cannot send any user information so, outside india so this india. could be a case for under regulating telecom rather than harmonizing the regulations coming from telecom and bringing exactly. them into oh, the exactly oh please tarun, uh, tarun, i am tarun, certainly tarun, I think, not for tarun. a moment suggesting that the telecom yeah. needs to be applied to other people i when i say harmonize i'm saying harmonize as a horizontal regulation that is applicable to telecom so i will probably get a relaxation in my current clauses on what is currently the situation but i do believe that there should be equitable treatment across uh, all people who are privy to uh, customer information uh, what is the other question nikhil no so and until uh, i mean uh, my my question was largely around the harm, uh, around the harmonization because you are effectively going to be governed by two sets of law one licensing condition and a law uh, but um, i'm i'm just curious about what other concerns you might have uh, from a data processing perspective in this bill um, because telecom operators do also process a lot of data right uh so data processing i mean we are basically data controllers of our subscribers uh hmm. and we are con- processing the very data that we control or otherwise we are engaging processors so for example we could have entities that are carrying out the billing for us hmm. so potentially uh, you know this talk about mixed data sets so i was just thinking about how it could impact us is for example my postpaid customer has given his bank account details you know for a standing instruction and uh, for the amount to be debited every month so if financial information is considered as sensitive personal data then that one item in itself will prevent me from getting maybe my processing done at a country of my choice so there are issues my basic approach to this would be that i know uh, shweta said i would like to know everything up front i think clarity is wonderful but it should be considered clarity you know like what i would ideally like is that each one of these things that they are planning to put into personal data sensitive personal critical person should be subjected to a consultation process people should be aware of the implications and impact of classifying a data under a particular field you know and sometimes it is only once those come up and the relevant stakeholders respond that you actually realize that it could be a impractical approach and therefore uh, the concept of proportionateness also needs to come in why is it sensitive why is it critical that that needs to be defined that on what basis so maybe some principles could come into the bill but to say this data is critical this is sensitive it's like then you're not giving these stakeholders an opportunity to even respond uh, so, the uh, another point that i like to make sure. let me just complete one more point sure. is that this should apply going forward it should not be like i'm supposed to fix past data it has to be applied the moment it comes in time needs to be given to bring it into play so i think it was earlier 2 years was given uh that amount of time is required to implement the bill and during this period maybe i think you know we need to adopt a graded approach even including on penalties you know to say straight away this is the law implemented otherwise you're going to get penalized it it's like a 
really hard-handed thing, especially for a lot of things where we still don't know how we're going to deal with it. Understand. Sorry, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, check whether there are any particular concerns, uh, additional concerns that you might have. I lost my my, my train of thought actually. Like, um, Aditi, do you, do you want to jump in while I think about what I was going to ask, Anjali? Uh, yes, sure. Actually, uh, my question was for Venkatesh that what's the impact? Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about data fiduciaries, data processors. How do we classify cloud service providers? So now, as Tarun also, uh, Tarun also pointed out, the uh, functions of cloud service providers are changing. So what kind of impact does it have on uh, cloud service providers as processors or data fiduciaries? Venkatesh, if you can. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks first of all, uh, Nikhil, for putting this Nidia Nama team for putting this together. Uh, am I coming through loud and clear? Aditi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, perfect. So thank you. I mean, uh, great to be doing this amidst all that's happening around us. So, so just to jump into the question that that you answered. So, a couple of points. One, I think uh, on the distinction between data process and controllers. I mean, just to reiterate. Uh, so the data principle uh, or you know a consumer. Uh, would give the data to a data controller and the data controller uh, is uh, ha has uh, contractual uh, obligations or contracts that it signs with data processors. So the data processors are always processing data on behalf of uh, these data controllers. So, um, so if you take cloud service providers, for example, cloud service providers uh, offer cloud storage, of course, uh, apart from that, they offer analytics, uh, infrastructure services. So they offer uh, a suite of services, uh, but in most all, in almost all cases, uh, they are not aware as to what they are processing on behalf of their uh, data controllers, right? So, so one of the, I mean, uh, I would say, you know, coming to that uh, the points that we would uh, look at in the personal data protection bill that's kind of concerning uh, for data processors. So there are three, uh, I mean, just quick, I mean, I'll mention three areas for this conversation and we can take it up in the discussion. So number one is engagement of sub processors. So right now the data processors cannot, um, I mean, data processors are not to engage sub processors except with the authorization of the data fiduciary. I mean, uh, so the controller, the fiduciary has to give uh, specific permission, uh, express permission to uh, allow that to happen. So we would want to make sure that uh, the this particular provision, which is I think 37.3, uh, uh, that you know uh, that can be uh, a, me a mechanism by which data process get say advanced clearance uh, and notify the data fiduciary uh, when they are doing sub processing. So that's number one. Number two is liability. Uh, data fiduciary. Uh, I mean, the bill sort of muddles uh, the the. I mean, it had a great opportunity to separate, like you know, the responsibility, the liability of DF and DPS. Uh, yeah. But bin, the bill muddles the water, right? So we would also recommend that it uh, removes the reference of imposing liability on uh, the data processors uh, for negligence. You know that particular. Uh, uh, the reason why I say that is there is uh, the this has to be governed by the contract between the data processors and the controllers, right? So for example, I mean, I just take an example. I mean, this is something we discussed. So uh, I am a particular startup uh, and I provide say a uh, food delivery uh, uh, opportunities. I contract a service provider uh, for my cloud hosting and also analytics, uh, all of that. Um, I mean, if there is a data breach that happens at uh, either of those cases, uh, there is a chain that is established, right? So what ideally would happen in this case is the data processor immediately gets back to the data controller, uh, the startup in this case, and, and informs that, hey, you know, this has happened. Uh, how do we, you know, uh, how do you want to proceed? And so then everyone will refer to the contract and then move from there. Uh, the last thing you want is as a data controller to be the last person to know what's happening. So, you know, this is how the mechanism works out. And of course, in the current bill, it is mandated that the data fiduciary and the data processor also can pay damages to the data principal. So what we would recommend is that the data fiduciary alone be responsible for uh, any compensation that needs to be provided to consumers uh, and the contractual obligation between the data processors and the data fiduciary be uh, uh, decided mutually amongst themselves to discuss what uh, should be uh, compensated, what is the compensation that the data processors need to pay in this regard. So. 
uh, if you see, I mean, there are, these are a couple of instances. And the last case I would mention is the security safeguards part, um, uh, where the bill mandates both the DPs and DFs to undertake implement, uh, implementation and review of security safeguards. So mm -hmm. in this case, I'd say, I mean, just to complete that thread is, uh, while both of them will uh, follow all the security safeguards, now again, in, in this case, the data processor sometimes might not be aware what data they are handling. Uh, so then they cannot give appropriate amount of safeguards. So even in that case, I think uh, we have other mechanisms. I mean, this was proposed in uh, in one of the public consultation meetings with Justice Sri Krishna as well, is how to use the data protection impact assessment uh, techniques and uh, what kind of agreements, uh, what kind of certification mechanisms we can have. And data process can obviously, uh, you know, voluntarily sign up for some of that. So I would right. say uh, just to complete the remarks that we should be in the position to be encouraging more of data processing as well. Uh, and, you know, um, given that investments in that uh, sector of companies would benefit sort of a wider population, small businesses, bigger businesses, whichever way, right? You know, you can make your own app for your own store, which what you want to do. So that's, uh, in order to do that, we should be able to make sure that we don't play undue burden on uh, the data processes. So I'll just stop right. there and... Uh, Venkatesh, uh, since you mentioned about liability, here I'd like to bring Jyotsna in. Uh, the assumption here is that the data fiduciary is technologically literate and also legally literate. But what happens when that is not the case, when the data fiduciary cannot bear the responsibility, doesn't have the technical know-how? So what should happen in that case? That, should the liability transfer to the processor in that case? So I think uh, it shouldn't transfer because that sort of uh, defeats the way in which the bill is structured in terms of ascertaining liability. So the construct under the bill is that if you are a data fiduciary, you will at all times be accountable and responsible for the processing of the data, regardless of you, ca of you carrying it out or engaging someone else to do so. And in fact, that's why it says that you need to have a contract. But I do understand and appreciate that you may have a scenario where the fiduciary itself is not as sophisticated, but the processor is. And then what happens in that instance? So in terms of um, you know, transitioning the liability, I don't think that the bill does account for it. And as long as the data processor is processing the data in accordance with the instructions of the fiduciary, even if it is ill-informed, uh, in that sense, there is some protection in the bill because the processor is never going to be liable if they do continue to process it in accordance with those instructions. But I think one of the important things that, that um, need to be discussed and Venkatesh touched upon, uh, upon it as well is the requirement to implement uh, security standards. So this is one of those direct obligations that a processor has under the bill, right? And so while all of the other obligations will contractually be passed down, this is something that they need to do and they're directly responsible for. And what is interesting is that this obligation says that you need to implement standards that are having regard to the purpose of processing and the nature of data. So in this instance where you have an ill-informed data fiduciary, and you don't, and they themselves are not able to sort of envisage all of the different types of processing or, um, you know, the, the categories of data that they are actually going to need process. Then that sort of enhances the liability that a processor may take on because they could be directly liable for failing to meet these security standards. So I think that's one thing that's important. But in the same vein, uh, generally, when we look at contractual liability, I believe that we are going to move away from uh, standard form contracts or click wrap contracts that you know, continue to be available for services, um, you know, platform hosting services or cloud services um, and things like that. And I think that it is important then at every stage to conduct an assessment, both of the customer as well as the processor. Uh, so while a it's very imperative for a customer to sort of conduct an assessment on the processor to see whether they will be able to have the adequate technological safeguards and understand the means of processing. I think in this case, given that a processor takes on liability directly in the instance that we discussed and also contractually because the data fiduciary will pass down all those obligations is to also conduct that sort, sort, sort of a counter assessment of your customer. Because uh, I would think that this would otherwise lead to several disputes under contract and therefore change the nature of these contracts from having a couple of clauses on data protection and cybersecurity to far more um, extensive provisions on indemnities, SLAs perhaps, or even termination um, uh, grounds that would then account specifically for these sorts of compliance. Right. Uh, thanks, Jyots. Now, before we dive deeper into how liability uh, will be contractually perhaps distributed, I'd like to bring in Mr. Chandrasekhar and ask him what kind of additional burdens does the bill place if 
a company is already a significant data fiduciary uh, by virtue of processing a large volume of uh yeah so uh, as far as uh, uh, the big mnc's are concerned uh the burden is uh, i mean it is only a delta on top of what is gdpr because fortunately we had to be ready for the gdpr we are only concerned now more about the provisions that are going much further than gdpr like non personal data and other things uh, because as uh, shweta was mentioning we need to uh, calibrate what is the kind of engineering effort what is the kind of effort for uh, making all our agreements and stuff like that so uh, the uh, additional burden uh, is significant but cannot be computed uh, adequately because of lack of clarity right uh, nikhil you had a question right there's a there's a question from the person actually about uh, Can't hear you, Nikhil. Uh, from Microsoft. Nikhil. Oh, sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, I'm not on mute. No, I, no. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's better. So, uh, so the question from from Deepak Maheshwari about what the implications are for B two C cloud services, specifically since you have Office three sixty five. considering that they would be data fiduciaries in the scenario and not data processors correct so this is one point which i wanted to bring up because uh, rama and venki had both uh, missed this point uh, microsoft is both a data fiduciary and a data processor so uh, we have our services like o365 and uh, dynamics and uh, various other services including our ai and cognitive services where uh, we are a fiduciary and we have our uh, plain play azure uh, ias and pass uh, where we are a, a data processor now in terms of the increase burden because uh, a lot of the services like o365 etc they are very consumer centric so uh, we have an increased burden about where all will the data flow uh for example uh, the authentication data which is the active directory that currently resides in various parts of the world uh, because a user should not have a problem wherever in the world the user goes uh, to be able to access it also in terms of redundancy if there is one da data center which goes down it's important for the data to be located at various parts so that it can easily come back to life in, uh, despite any uh problem with the uh, disaster so there is a additional compliance uh, burden which as i said before is being very closely uh, watched as to how uh, the data uh, just a second i've got some uh, this is just Uh, i am sorry somebody was keeping on ringing the bell so i was getting distracted so <clears throat> we have not been able to exactly compute the uh, extra effort uh, required because of the gaps in the uh, thing but there will definitely be some additional effort required right uh, so so you raised some important points about how an entity by itself can be both a fiduciary and a processor here i'll i'd like to bring nikhil in uh, nikhil narendra in that is where cloud computing is computing as a service and uh, as well as processing as a service so there's two aspects to it so is there a chance of thinking of a cloud service provider in particular as perhaps a co fiduciary because at times the processing might be determined by the cloud service provider yeah you're right so i think uh, that's probably one uh, one area where i'll probably differ from most of the other panelists uh, because i think most of the current uh cloud models i mean if they are infrastructure based services pure hosting pure storage etc then there is no question of even an argument coming up that a cloud service provider could be considered as a fiduciary but if you are moving to a realm where it's more of services that's being provided on cloud or if you are moving to services where the data fiduciary itself do not have much control over the actual process of processing that happens of the data right or if the data uh, fiduciary doesn't have much of visibility on the process 
uh, that's been happening in the back end. There is a gray area which exists, and that's where I think the bill sort of uh, lacks the clarity. Like, for instance, I mean, this is not just a debate in India. This is also a debate uh, under India. And um, you can't hear me? Yeah. So I was saying, um, so this is a G debate under the GDPR as well. And uh, what's happening is that traditionally companies across the globe, lawyers across the globe has taken the stand that, look, we will structure this contractually, purely contractually, and we'll ensure that we place someone as a data fiduciary, which is usually the customer of the cloud service, and we contractually manage the relationship between the parties. But um, what sort of uh, uh, came up after that is some of the regulators, including the EU regulators, uh, the ICO in the UK, came out with uh, some list of detailed checklists on how you can determine who is a fiduciary, who is a data processor. And in some instances, you can see that there is some level of control, which is uh, actually being done by the data processors, mostly cloud service providers who provide uh, a particular software as a service or a particular processing as a service. And often this question comes up as to, should we take care of uh, these measures while we contact to ensure that we don't classify ourselves as a, con a, a controller in, under the GDPR? So I think we have uh, pretty much adopted the same definition uh, as GDPR to our uh, PDP bill as well, which means that we may also eventually see this problem happening. So this is mostly on the software as a services or processing as a service or, uh, services models. But eventually what we'll see is the extension of the cloud to literally edge, right? The networks or the equipment sitting at the edge, which is collecting data, which is processing the data, then the transfer to uh, data over the cloud happens and processing happens. When the cloud really moves to the edge, we'll see this line even being blurred. So that level of clarity is not there in PDP bill. That's because it, it sort of uh, heavily relies on the GDPR. And I think when we move on to these, these kind of new services, probably in a year or two, uh, we'll see this problem uh, coming up more often. And we will see the line between processor and the fiduciary being blurred again. And the companies will have to take extra efforts and steps while contracting or while determining you know, uh, the standards, the internal standards that they put in place to ensure that uh, they are safe. Otherwise, there is always a risk of them being classified as a fiduciary because of the fact that the actual data fiduciary with, who is contractually liable to the customer doesn't have necessarily control over uh, necessary controls over the processing of the data that happens at the processor's end. That is the cloud service provider's end. Right. Uh, uh, Jyotsna, I'll just come to you in one minute. Uh, Tarun, you posted a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Do you want to raise that up? Yeah, so I think like uh, what Nikhil uh, Narendran pointed out was that like obviously the cloud is becoming more complicated. So earlier the cloud was like purely being able to provide compute and storage. And now cloud also involves providing like a lot of uh, software services stacks. Mm -hmm. Now, since we are talking about like harmonization of uh, responsibilities, now suppose there is a customer, he has a choice of using a cloud service or he has a choice of using a uh, software uh, written by uh, like an ISV. So uh, again, on the same compute. So mm -hmm. would Nikhil suggest like a harmonization of the responsibilities there also? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's possible really to ensure a complete harmonization. I mean, especially if it's you're, you're talking about an ISV and are you talking so about an Let me give an example. So okay. let's say there is relational database service and there is a database software produced by an ISV. Uh, so in that case, like, is that ISV also uh, somewhere responsible as a data processor or uh, like something or like, so you can have vulnerability in a database software, right? And that causes like personal data to be leaked. Now, who is responsible in that case? Like, well, so I, I don't think there is any question of control which even arises over the in, in this case because the ISP has don't have any sort of control over the data because they purely look at one time. Right? So there is no question of a leak that happens which can be attributable uh, to the processor itself. I mean, even if there is, that that's something that needs to be taken care of at the at the contractual level, right? So there is no question of relationship vis a vis the the end. Uh, user per se and the ISP in this case. Sure, sure. Now, in case of an RDS service provided by a cloud provider, he is using the same software. So he is just providing ease of use 
in terms of that software not being used by the end customer, the data fiduciary on his own, but provides the monitoring and orchestration and provisioning layer uh, for the very same software for which the ISV is actually not responsible. Now, but does the cloud provider now become responsible over there? No, I don't think so. So I'm not, I'm not literally talking about uh, 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 RDB example that you gave me at all. I'm, I'm more talking about, see, the, kind, the level of control that the fiduciary will have over the software that's installed, right? And the level of control that he can exercise over the use of data, right? So the question is, what is the, it's, it's a factual question. What is the level of control that uh, the data fiduciary will have over the processing that happens? And if the processing, if the, if the data fiduciary do not have the level of control is where it starts becoming blurred and questions starts raising against who determine what data needs to be collected, who determine what data needs to be processed. So that's precisely the questions that's asking in, that's being asked in the EU. That who determine the data, what data sets are you collecting? Who determine actual processing? Does the controller have any sort of control over the processing that happens? Can he determine and change those controls and suggest a different way of processing altogether? Does he have any sort of visibility onto the processing that happens? These are the kind of questions that's being asked. Nikhil, if I could just jump in. Yeah, I was just going to go to you, Shweta. Yes, so if I, could, if I could just jump in here to also say that while I understand this debate is going on, just the sheer merits of having that clean definition between a data processor and a data fiduciary is way too much, too high because especially if you if you start talking about the demerits when the lights are blurring and secondly the fact that everything that we're talking about uh, Shweta, I'm, all I'm of the sorry, examples we that couldn't hear the first part of what you said because of the connectivity okay, is issue it, is the connection Could better you are you able to hear me we can yeah? let, let's try again Okay, sorry. Uh, apologies, just ask me to pause if you can't. But I was just saying that that I think there is a lot of merit in going by the contractual uh, obligations between the data processor and the data fiduciary rather than blurring the lines in the law because that creates way more complications. And I think those clean definitions of who a data processor is and what the role is versus a data controller, a data fiduciary is very, very important. And we should rely on robust contractual agreements between the two rather than trying to say that uh, you know, we, we need to blur the lines or a data processor starts is performing the role of a data fiduciary because uh, that creates way too many complications. Do you think, Shweta, that uh, storage should be a part of the definition of a data processor? Storage is. Storage is fine. I mean, data processor but, can store... But should it be? Yes, yes. That's, that's because, not... because how does that impact incidental storage of data? I mean, for example, in case of a, uh, in case of a telecom operator transferring data, I'm, I'm going to come to... Anjali about that as well. Yeah, so I, I'm not very well versed with that and I will yeah. I will that to either, uh, you know, one of the legal experts or uh, Anjali to answer. But I think the only point that we want to make as a company is that, that it's very important that we continue to honor the definitions of data processors and data controllers. And there is merit in the fact that there is a strong contractual agreement between the two and the law should continue to treat the two differently, whether it's in terms of obligations or of liabilities uh, and, and blurring those definitions is not going to be helpful. Okay. Uh, first, Anjali, then Jotsna had a point to make as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nikhil. So, uh, from my point of view, the data fiduciary is the one that has the direct relationship with a customer and is collecting the data for the provision of service. Now, for the provision of service, if a certain amount of processing is required, and the fiduciary ties up with another entity to process the data for the service that is to be provided to the consumer. So I don't know whether there is a blurring of lines unless you're saying that the processor could also be collecting data independently from customers and therefore taking on the rail, uh, role of a data controller. But that has nothing to do because it's a B2B back-to-back -back arrangement uh, between the controller and the fiduciary for fulfilling the provision of service. And therefore, I agree that there should be a contractual arrangement between the controller and the processor as to how the data which is being shared with the processor is processed. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Nikhil. Uh, Jyotsna wanted to say something. Yes. No, sorry. I just actually wanted to add to what Anjali is saying. And, and I would also agree that in terms of definitions, 
this is probably how far uh, we can go because it clearly says that if you are determining the means and the methods and the purpose, then you're the controller. But the problem arises in the fact that this classification is a functional classification. So as much as you try to determine upfront exactly what your roles would be, given that particularly in the case of cloud service providers, it's no longer such a passive role. You will find yourself often stepping in and out of being a controller and a processor. And therefore, while of course there's only so much we can predict, I think that the scope and therefore the demarcation of responsibilities is then what will find importance in a contract. Because um, the minute you know that these are the only 10 or 11 sets of actions that you're going to take, you will at that point be able to exercise some sort of judgment on which of the two categories that you will fall under vis-a-vis -vis that contract. So that's basically just what, what I want to do. So just to sort of come in from here, Akbar, so one of the most important aspects that uh, you just mentioned. Nikhil, uh, Nikhil could you... So, the data, especially in telecom, so you, uh, because that's essentially an ISP is also storing and transferring, right? But and by the IT Act considers incidental storage, does the PDP will consider it? Uh, so, Nikhil, uh, so I'll just get to that. I just want to sort of add mm -hmm. on to one thing that Anjali was saying. So, um, it's precisely the relationship between the end data subject or the data principle and uh, the data fiduciary is, you know, it, it's who has a direct contractual relationship is actually a very determinant factor, but that is completely absent in the definition in both PDP bill and the GDPR, right? So that's one of the, you know, and the clarification that there needs to be a contract between the data subject and the data controller uh, came out later by way of uh, judgments and, you know, by these rulings and courts of practices issued by various regulators. So that's probably one of the most, uh, you know, definite reasons why there is actually a blur. There is actually a gray area there, which might make life difficult for us, the cloud service providers in future. Now, yeah, coming on to your question, Nikhil. So I personally believe that um, one of the one of the ways in which GDPR was tackled by European Union telecom companies uh, is by relying on the legitimate uh, interest processing exemption. Because uh, the ways in which a telco handles your data is very, very complicated. So right from your IPDR, IP data records that's been collected to the traffic that passes through their network to the backend uh, the processes that you do by way of legal intercept and monitoring and other things, it, I think it's pretty much impossible for a telco to go and take consent from the customer and you're look, mind you that we are looking at very sensitive data that passes through uh, that's, that's handled by a telco. For instance, let's say a location data. Uh, and that uh, kind of granular level of consent will be impossible for a telco to handle under the current PDP bill. So that's where uh, the GDPR comes into play. And most uh, EU telcos treat the data that's collected from the customers under the bucket of legitimate interest processing and uh, do not take actual consent because this is a, the, the, the telco industry expects and the industry and the technology in the telco industry is designed in such a manner that they have to collect certain data to even transfer data from one point of time. And there are several regulatory obligations that's on the telcos. So I think that's going to be one pain point for under the PDP bill for the Indian telcos. I, I'd like to hear more from Anjali if, if uh, you have any thoughts on that. Uh no, I don't think so. I mean, like in the sense, we get our customers to sign a CAF, a customer application form. And the data which is usually collected, it's the fields are mandated by the DOT, name, address, billing, preferences, MNP, telemarketing, et cetera, et cetera. But insofar as the CDR records, and that is the very, I mean, that is the fundamental of the service that is being provided. So I do not need to ask my customer's permission that can I create a CDR or in fact, uh, the DOT requires me that in the IP CDR or something location details are also being sought. There is a format which is given. So that's very clearly laid down as a regulatory and uh, licensing requirement. I don't think it comes under a issue of consent in that sense, you know, that you, will you allow me to create a CDR? Uh, the uh, all these data that are being collected will come under the ambit of what is called inferred data because that is by virtue of provision of the service. 
and therefore the uh, ambit and scope of the data protection bill to include this data into that whole gamut of privacy cannot share it is forget that is where the problems will start coming uh, so, so I again i am fundamentally i'm a great believer in that at least discuss before putting in anything saying it is forget you need to know what the implications of these words are clarity yeah. is good but that it should be considered clarity i think yeah. I so i think just just to sort of uh, respond to anjali so i think this is where uh, a precise problem is going to come because i i don't think there is a specific exemption uh, for the kind of data that you just mentioned even uh, the kind of data that's required to be collected the exemption is only for collecting personal data under a statute right so this is by way of extension this is a statute then there are licenses issued under the statute right so that itself could be debated when the pdp bill comes up where uh, there is no standard exception under the pdp bill as, as of now for the processing of data by telcos this is not just for telcos this could also equally apply to banking and finance right another sector where uh, similar kind of regulatory data collection happens and processing happens right? so, no, so are, are you are you suggesting that we won't be able to collect it or we'll have to take that permission because this is not data which is collected it's created by virtue yeah. of the service so i can exactly. understand that treatment of the data could be a issue but the the use of that data for the provision of service i'm not able to understand the concern that you are indicating yeah so i think uh, the similar sort of uh, uh, similar is a case with let's say uh, the behavioral data that's collected by a platform such as facebook right for instance uh, i am browsing facebook i am zooming onto a photo but the very fact that i am zooming onto a photo will be collected by facebook and that's behavioral data so i think it's similar to uh, the same kind of data it's integral to providing the services that facebook is providing similarly any data that's collected by telco will be also integral to the service that telco is providing there is no dispute about that but the question is in the absence of a clarification or an extension under the bill how will the data collection and processing be treated and what is your responsibility as a, a company which deals with the data to go and get and inform the customer get their consent uh, or inform them about all the processing that you are doing with respect to the data because, because i believe that's a huge amount of data that's being processed in ways which are uh, completely uncomprehensible for a common man right and you have to technically under the pdp bill make sure that it's communicated to the end user in a manner which is or you know which is which is understood understandable by them in a very transparent manner so i i i can't just imagine at the you know the level of compliance that you will have to go through to actually do that well, anjali i think you have given us a great segue to talk about inferred data because now inferred data is part of the definition of personal data itself so my question is actually to shweta here that when for instance salesforce is providing cloud service uh, cloud services or CI is it also generating infer data by running data analytics on all of it uh, so uh, aditi i am not in a position to talk company specific stuff which uh, which uh, as you can understand will be a concern but i can talk in general about uh, the fact that uh, the bill has included inferences as part of the definition of personal data and that's something that we believe uh, should be excluded and not be included as part of the scope of the bill it's exactly the view that for instance uh, bsa has put out as well and venki can talk about it and we as being active members of bsa support that view that including inferences as a definition of personal data is some thing that should not be done it is not something that has been done in gdpr and there are various uh, obvious ramifications of that that we believe well will as not in the larger interest of of this overall uh, architecture that we're trying to put in place uh so if i may uh tarun to chandrashekar if you can talk about what, that while providing services as data processors is uh in is inferred data incidentally generated not intentionally but incidentally uh mr chandrashekar you are on mute uh j- just uh, repeat the question once so that i am uh, clear about it yes that so when you talking yeah when a out service provider provides uh, analytical services as a processor does it create incidental infer data that is not intentionally but unintentionally uh yes so that is a cause of conf- uh, concern for us so all our services have got 
an inherent layer of uh, security there are a lot of which go and we monitor bots we monitor if somebody's computer has been taken control of by bots so all this can generate uh, inferred data also if you go to the other realm you have uh, the iot devices that can generate inferred data uh, you have ai and cognitive services that can generate inferred data so we want inferred data to be completely uh, dropped from the purview because while the intent might be very noble the way it will play out might become nightmarish so just uh, jumping in on this uh, the i mean so this the what uh, chanshekar ended with is the point i think um, when the in discussion about inferred data comes up i think a lot of people wonder why uh, you know why are we saying it should be excluded but the question is again uh, what are we trying to solve here uh, it is privacy and personal data protection so it's not uh, you know if a product is coming up because of that and there are other concerns with that product we'll have need to so sort it in another manner but in this case if there are adequate safeguards so which is encryption or uh, anonymization or whichever uh, we take are followed and if someone is doing uh, giving some of those services uh, for either the controller or the processor themselves are undertaking it based on the contract uh, and it doesn't in, in uh, is it not in violation of privacy that it should be completely uh, allowed and so it should be excluded from the definition i mean it significantly broadens the definition of personal data and it does not add to what we are promising the consumer which is complete privacy for the data that we are trying to protect okay uh yes, sarun you had something to add sure, yes sure. so i i i tend to be broadly in agreement with what chandrashekhar said Uh, because if you look at the newer technology techniques of artificial intelligence so primarily what you are doing is like uh, a customer is feeding a artificially intelligent model uh, his own data now of yeah. course the inferred data becomes a part of this retrained model forever and this cannot be deleted this cannot be forgotten this cannot be unlearned so it it becomes a part of the uh, model repository forever so that would be very very hard to separate out and like it would be easier to uh, not go towards inferred data as like uh, personalized data in general uh, but specific exceptions can probably be made like okay are you trying to infer about like uh, personalized data and then actually uh, verbalizing it in the form of like what books you like uh, not what books you may like but what books you like or what movies you like like uh, fine like matlab uh, whatever reasonable exceptions have to be there uh, for inferred data to be regulated like those should be made but in general inferred data should not be included is my opinion so uh, we've got uh, udbhav also here udbhav do you have any concerns related to inferred data udbhav uh, thanks nikhil uh, i i think that um, it's it's a sort of very delicate balancing act because i mean we've already had some conversations on anonymous data and whether something like anonymous data can even exist in the first place and the possible risks that can occur from reidentification and how the bill sort of specifically criminalizes that i do think that inferred data shouldn't be a part of the data protection bill uh, because of the fact that many of the like protections that the data protection bill gives to data can't apply to inferred data in the way that they are present in the bill because inferred data at the end of the day more often than not is insights it's not necessarily data purely as we understand it however i don't think that necessarily means that inferred data should not be regulated at all i think that we've already seen even in the report that the european union came out with just uh, two days ago on how gdpr has been successful there are some sort of concerns that they've also raised on anonymized data and on inferred data and how the fact that they've been completely excluded from the purview of the gdpr has led to some sort of difficulties in enforcement so we can have a conversation about how to best regulate inferred data that's also a conversation for example that ai regulation tends to deal with with regard to transparency and accountability but i think within the scope of the data protection bill is something we should be wary of the data protection authority should be prepared for but i don't think we need to see changes in the bill sort of per se to be able to deal with that uh, possibility right uh udav it's a good thing that you uh... that you raised the uh, concern around anonymized data i have a question for venkatesh that how will government access to non personal data under section 91 uh, affect cloud service providers 
Yeah, so I, I mean, this is again been a, one of the most contentious uh, provisions uh, that's come up in the 2019 version of the bill. So uh, for cloud service providers, as I started in the beginning of the conversation, it's very simple. Uh, if at all we have access to that data, it's in a form that uh, large, I mean, it will not communicate what uh, you as a consumer give, right? So the data controllers uh, who take care of the uh, data handling uh, process, storage or analytics, they will ensure that when they pass it on to, they should ensure that then they pass it on to the data processes that uh, they have specific contractual obligations of not uh, data controllers not being able to see what's there. Um, so that way privacy is guaranteed. So if I'm using a, star, a, a cloud storage facility, I have very little idea of the data that I'm handling. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm storing four columns of data, I'm giving a very rudimentary example. One is a sensitive personal information. One is about health. The other is an, uh, maybe an inferred data. Now that example has come up and say two other columns which have something to do with non-sensitive, non-critical and pretty uh, simple data. As cloud service providers, I have no uh, idea of how you are categorizing, how the data controller is categorizing all these classes of data. All I get is a dump. At times I provide uh, uh, say analytic service, which let me access certain aspects, but that is also based on what the controller has told me uh, to. So to, it's out of question to be even in a position to handle. I mean, we don't have sometimes the technology to handle, uh, to, to infer what is per, what, what, Part of it is non-personal data. And on top of it, if the government does ask for it, it will be impossible uh, or more, more importantly, illegal uh, to give it as well. So uh, it, uh, and I think I would also mention that company, uh, there have been some recommendations of filtering techniques of how these kind of data could easily be identified. Uh, if, if at all companies are doing that, definitely that's also illegal if uh, cloud service providers are doing it without the knowledge of uh, the controllers, or sometimes even the data subjects need to know this. Right. Uh, so I think that's something that a lot of people have also mentioned, that we don't know where the definition of personal data ends and where the definition of non-personal data begins because of this bridge called inferred data. Uh, before moving forward, uh, Nikhil, I wanted to clarify one thing uh, with you. You mentioned that there is no contractual obligation placed uh, uh, on the data the, on the data fiduciary to have a contract with the data processor. Uh, did I understand you correctly? I thought under section 31, there is a contractual. I'm sorry if I misunderstood you. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think I said that. I said, look, the contract needs to be very carefully drafted to ensure that um, the lack of uh, definitional clarity of a fiduciary should be taken care of so that cloud service providers who end up providing services or processing as a service do not end up being uh, a data fiduciary. That's what I said. And can I just come in on one bit on the inferred data point? Um, Go ahead. Uh, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So I, I see, I, I'll tell you uh, as a perspective of a customer, I think the entire purpose of data protection will be defeated if inferred data is not regulated. Uh, because I think that's going to be the, that's literally the, uh, biggest tool in the hands of, uh, so to speak, the technology companies. And that's where most likely privacy violations are about to happen, right? But I completely understand the point with respect to the fact that, look, it brings up practical difficulties while implementing or while uh, creating new algorithms or doing big data processing for that matter. So there is a, a very advanced approach that one could take towards that. And the reason why this problem is really significant under the PDP bill is because of the fact that we don't have a legitimate interest processing under the bill, unlike the GDPR. So currently under the GDPR, because there is a contractual necessity clause and a legitimate business interest processing clause, you don't need to necessarily go and take the consent of each and every party because it's a very uh, natural outcome of the processing that you're carrying out. So one problem, a significant problem can be solved by that. Then there are questions about data minimization and other aspects with respect to info data. I think, of course, that's that's legitimate business processing is not necessarily an answer to that. But I think, of course, we need to look further to solve those issues as well. Even I believe in, in EU as well, there have been uh, debates around that uh, on how to handle minimization retention practices for info data. Uh, so Subodeep had a bunch of questions. Uh, Subodeep? 
Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks. If you could unmute. Yeah. Thanks, Nikhil. Uh, so yeah, I think primarily I was coming from the perspective of of sort of what's being discussed, uh, you know, uh, yesterday, uh, which is essentially the fact that the government is talking about scrapping its bulk data use policy, and in the context of what happened with not just with Vahan, but what happened a few months back, right, with respect to the the sort of the misuse scenarios at the time of the Delhi riots. So I just wanted to have the panel weighing in as to what kind of implications would such kind of a bulk data sharing policy from the state carry under the existence of a PDP framework? What would the implication be? And the second part of my question was essentially to see that uh, you know the fact is now that if if we are talking about moving to uh, cit citizen sharing reports around analysis of of vehicular data. I mean, how would, how would that sort of take place? Are they talking about anonymizing data and not keeping anything sensitive in nature and then creating some sort of analytics out of it? I'm just curious to know how uh, so that would be. Uh, just in terms of the data that was being shared, uh, that was personal data. I don't think it is anonymized data. Yeah, I, uh, so Nikhil, just to clarify, I'm talking about what they're talking about doing next. So essentially, okay, if, I, if I read the Mint report today, they're essentially yeah. saying that we move to uh, anonymizing that data perhaps in some way. Uh, which again brings me to the question of whether uh, are we talking about non-personal data here if we are trying to anonymize this and you know creating analytics out of the Vahan database in, in terms of... Okay, so I'm going to take that question to Shweta and yeah. Shweta also wanted to make some comments. Uh, she had to drop off at four. Shweta? Yeah, sure. Uh, so very quickly, I think I just want to take further the discussion around non-personal data. And I think uh, the, the real alarm within the industry on why this has been included in the PDP, and as uh, Rama was also mentioning earlier, that it was not there in the original draft, and now it's been included. I think there are some real, um, you know, structural issues with, ha with having non-personal data and the fact that there is access to non-personal data being uh, asked for in the bill. And as we mentioned that number one, as data processors, companies like Salesforce, we have actually no control and we don't intend to have any control over understanding the data that is being provided to us by our customers, by our data controllers. So uh, putting an obligation on data processors uh, to uh, first understand uh, the categorization of the data and to uh, put the obligation on, on them to provide that data to the government, I think is something that is uh, almost impossible to comply with. And I'm sure that will be challenged. And, and I really do hope that uh, the committee looking into the bill is going to understand that this is something which is impossible for, uh, for us to go through. And I think uh, we also need to understand that, that the government has put in place an entire mechanism. There is a Gopalakrishnan committee that has been set up to look into the issue of non-personal data. And now to mix issues, to include non-personal data as part of a personal data protection bill, uh, to complicate issues further just doesn't make sense. So I think the only thing we would urge the government is keep NPD aside, keep non-personal data aside. Let's try and understand it. It's a different animal altogether. And also what the government is really trying to solve, the intent may sound I mean, the intent may be right that you're, all that you're trying to get is anonymized data and use it for community benefit purposes. And, and that that is understandable. But uh, I think the, the purpose and the manner in which they are going about it, it's, it's very, very different. And I don't think it's achieving the purpose. Rather, it's complicating issues a lot more. So um, I, I think I'll just wrap up there on the NPD issue, but also just reemphasize something that I had mentioned right at the beginning, which is that uh, perhaps a very, very opportune moment for the parliamentary committee right now, given what is happened in the last uh, three to four months uh, to the world is to take a hard look at, at uh, the data protection bill, make it very, very robust because yes, in today's times, uh, the need for data privacy and data security has only gone up and there is a heightened need to have in place a very robust architecture. At the same time, uh, for, you know, uh, please, uh, we have to ensure that that it is not hampering the innovation ecosystem in any way and it's actually using the, the ben benefits that a cloud ecosystem brings to global digital economy rather than taking away from some of those benefits. So I'll just uh, wrap it there from me, Nikhil. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, Shreta, just to respond to one bit, I think the reason why they put NPD in this bill is because they need uh, legislative approval for NPD, and instead of having a separate law after the committee, they're trying to create that framework for this bill. Even, I mean, you know, like I said, it's all it's kind of weird that that uh, non-personal data is a part of a personal data protection bill. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, thanks so much, Shreta, for joining us.
So um, there is there is a question uh, from Arjun Sena Roy about the implications. Of, sorry, uh, before we get to Arjun's question, Shobhadeep, I don't think your question has been answered. Does anyone want to take that? Uh, Nikhil on uh, non-personal data. Uh, you, you're on mute, Nikhil. I said I'm, I was unable to find the question here. Uh, Shubhadi, uh, just for you, do you want to re repeat the question? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, of the question. So hi, Nikhil. So yeah, my question, I think, yeah, just to quickly sort of, you know, take the your sort of understanding of what what quite kind of precipitated yesterday. Now the government has cracked a bulk data sharing policy over, you know, privacy and misuse concerns. But I just want to understand that can the state have powers to to create sort of these bulk data sharing framework place under a PDP framework? And if so, if in, in terms of the direction in which, let's take the example of the Vahan database, uh, if they are not talking about making citizen reports available, how would that work? In the sense of, would it be under the garb of creating an anonymized data sets and analyzing that? Uh, thanks. Yeah, so I think the PDP bill gives the government a uh, vast amount of power and probably it's, it's pretty much nothing applies to the government, right? So. Um, it's uh, so the government can literally create any number of databases and and work under the PDP bill, and it sort of gives them some sort of a legislative sanction as well to do it. Um, so uh, to answer your question, so I think we'll see more of these Wahan kind of database incidents happening uh, very often. Uh, with respect to anonymization, um, I'm, I'm sure they're going to rely on anonymization provisions to. Uh, sort of strengthen the legitimacy around the kind of databases that they're going to create. But I'm not sure if that's that's going to be the final solution, so to speak, in terms of transparency, because uh, the ultimate challenge that we have, I mean, for instance, um, I mean, classic example is the Arogya Sedu project, right? I mean, the, the protocol looks beautiful uh, uh, in terms of, in theory, right? It's probably one of the best that we have in uh, compared to uh, global market practices. I'm telling you this because I have literally, um, uh, the report just came out, we did a uh, study for Human Technology Foundation where me and Smriti uh, were involved in it and, and we found that it is pretty much global standards. But the point is there's no way that you can hold the government accountable for it. You cannot uh, technically challenge the government's decision. We don't know, uh, there is no transparency really with respect to what's happening. It's all just in theory. So in theory, it'll, uh, they can come out with these things, but unless the PDP bill has some sort of a stick which can be used to hold the government accountable, it's it's not going to really help us as uh, a country or a democracy. Uh, so uh, if I may, Shubhadeep, uh, if I may. Uh, yeah, so basically uh, what will happen is that uh, the existing uh, policy frameworks, like there is this open data framework, uh, that will have more personal data nuances. There will be uh, increased use of technology of uh, anonymization, de-identification, etc. At the same time, there will be much higher level or sophisticated level of analytics to draw insights. So currently, the open data framework does not have too many uh, what is it, safeguards from the privacy angle. With PDP coming, government will have to go back onto the drawing board with many of these, whether there are any privacy implications. So there will be a lot of business coming Nikhil's way for uh, examining the privacy aspects of many of the existing provisions. Only if government paid. Just, uh, just to add the final uh, point, uh, Shubhadeep, I think uh, uh, from... Uh, from the Niti Aayog perspective, when they were doing the whole uh, piece on AI, this was a question that we had actively debated uh, with the Singapore PDPC as well. Uh, here, it is not bulk, but data, basically the whole point of, uh, you know, marketplace for data, right? So uh, big, uh, the concern right now is small companies don't have access to data, personal data, of course, but besides that as well, uh, but you don't, need to give personal data the way uh, you know it violates privacy the question is is there a way we can uh, use some other methods and i remember niti ayog arnab and a couple of others from the vadwani foundation and uh, we were discussing this in bombay so if you are interested uh, they are struggling with similar questions so 
uh, they might have found some answers by now or not but yeah that's something to uh, also consider uh, there's a question from arjun sena roy about what are the implications of inferred data on the logistics slash iot industry how does it impact iot based business applications uh, arjun is an iot entrepreneur so uh, does anyone want to take that yes okay. uh, i can i can attempt it uh, but so see uh, today there is a, a lot of uh, like iot is just i mean you are in the iot field it's that wave is just starting so let me give you a couple of examples which we can visualize so suppose we have iot devices on uh, every axle of a toyota car or a car of any brand you can infer a lot of data from that how a person is driving what is his driving pattern uh, how many times he brakes does he brake suddenly does he accelerate suddenly now basis that the, the insurance premium can change and a lot of things can be inferred about the person's lifestyle and stuff like that so that takes us into a, a gray area of a regulatory gray area whether that kind of data can be shared and how it can be used and whether that inferred data is going against the privacy of that individual and stuff like that so i haven't thought through uh, very clearly i know a couple of use cases like this which we have been discussing but how exactly it will play out uh, i am uh, i don't have the full answers aditi you are on mute uh so during our discussion we have briefly touched upon to non personal data but there's also a significant part of the bill about gov government access to personal data as well as exemptions from uh, exemptions for processing without consent so jyotsna my question is to you that under section 12 could data processors also potentially be exempted from seeking consent for processing personal data for the purposes of providing government services so processors uh, don't need to get consent the obligation is on the fiduciary and so this uh, you know section 12 that you are referring to is one of the non consensual grounds that are available to the state uh, so to that extent if if the data fiduciary which is the state and they are processing under 12 then they don't need to get consent and of course there won't be anything that would flow onto the data processor but i think what is worth looking at is the other exemption um, under 37 uh, 37 35 which basically says that the government can exempt any of the provisions of the bill or the entire bill uh, to its activities Sorry. Right. Yes. Please continue. So I think that would be an interesting analysis because what it does is that in that sense it exempts the government as a data fiduciary with respect to any uh, processing activities carried out. But then what happens to the data processors? Because the government itself will engage several CSPs in that sense uh, to carry out these functions. Right. So I don't know whether the consequence is. then to say that only the processors will be held liable when the government itself is not liable given that they've exempted themselves from the bill and also that as a processor you are acting in accordance with the instructions of the fiduciary and so if the fiduciary is not going to face any liability under the bill it seems a bit strange that the processor will have to take on or assume that role but i think that's important uh, to look at and particularly in relation to the government cloud service providers also are currently regulated under uh, you know several other empanelment and bid documents and there's the megraj policy that also specifies the manner in which you can provide cloud services to the government and in fact data localization is one important thing there it doesn't even go into personal data but it says all data has to be stored in india so um, i think when you are providing services to the government um, and they have either exempted themselves by way of this section or don't need to get consent it's important then to see what sort of obligations continue to rest with you as a data processor right because from what i understand under section 35 it can only be for a few very specific purposes where provision of government services isn't one of them but current yeah. public order is also fairly broad so i mean it's it's vague in that sense right understood uh, tarun you had a comment so uh, my comment was about the uh, penalties for offences under this act so uh, like uh, it doesn't seem to uh, treat like uh, so it seems to treat like companies as a whole and uh, kind of like the language is like looks very problematic to me it says that like nothing anything contained in subsection etc uh, has been committed by company and it is proved that uh, 
with consent connivance attributable to any neglect on the part of any director manager secretary another officer of the company so uh, that seems like overtly uh, very very broad like so uh, i believe like mostly gdpr is like about financial penalties but over here like we seem to be dealing with the more uh, non billable cognizable kind of offenses and uh, uh, neglect would be like a very very problematic word over here like uh, wh- what what do you think like nikhil about this so i mean um i'm just trying to look at the section if i remember correctly see i think there is there is a need for intention uh, to be there even in that case i just need to so i think it's it's the the, the provision is about who are uh, intentionally reidentifies the data that's when i think the trigger comes in i, I yeah but I'm apart from intent there is also neglect which is a very very passive action so like yeah. which can obviously be So, so I mean, Karan, I have a question back to you. So I mean, in practice, how much, uh, uh, how how much do you think? Let me reality? let me give you an example. So, for example, there is a new vulnerability in a database system, right? A zero-day vulnerability. Now, how quickly can a provider react to it and apply the patches to RDS? Obviously, there has to be a window of several days before the customers would be notified, and like uh, that would happen. and there could be a small window where uh, uh, like a cloud provider would be within their own lab trying to figure out like what's the real impact of this vulnerability that has been published by uh, some random hacker about a zero day vulnerability so like uh, would that like uh, come under like neglect like so obviously uh, as a cloud provider you are supposed to react fast uh, to a new vulnerability that has come in and potentially since this is data storage of some sort we are talking about in a relational database which could potentially store personal data like uh, where where do you stand over there yeah so i think i i took a look at the section while while you were also speaking so i think uh, the the mention of the word knowingly is a problem because you know you will have knowledge of of the vulnerability but intentionally uh, is an okay standard in the sense that you're not doing it intentionally So you should be okay. So probably striking out also, knowingly it from the bill also mentions be- like one is knowingly, of course, like if you are knowingly done something, you have gone and stolen data from a customer. By all means, you are liable. Hang that guy. Uh, but uh, over here, it also mentions or is attributable to any neglect on the part of any director, manager, secretary, or other officer of the company. So that's a that's that sort of qualifier to the first offence. So first, we need to knowingly or intentionally re-identify, right? And then. uh there was a director who negligently let that happen then he is liable that's the way you should read it so okay. just because okay. of the fact that someone was negligent you 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 may not be liable. i i do hope that like uh, the officers of the dpa also read it the same way yeah i'm i'm sure i'm i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure the dpa will be qualified enough to read it that way i'm not sure about the the local level enforcement of that uh, so if the police were to handle it i was not i'm not sure okay fair enough fair enough fair enough right so, uh, so so we are uh, kind of running out of time and i think this has been a fantastic discussion uh, i was adhi to prioritize three questions uh, after which uh, i guess uh, there are lots of people who have questions and if anyone would like to stay on anyone wants to discuss uh, we'd be happy to bring you into the discussion as well kind of like an open session so adhi uh, go ahead and then uh, we'll just move to an open session So my first question is, uh, what concerns do you have vis-a-vis adequacy requirements, and how well does this bill perform, uh, say with respect to the Cloud Act in the US or GDPR in the EU? So just now we can start with you. Okay, so um, I don't think that we're doing going to do very well uh, in terms of meeting the adequacy um, eligibility under the GDPR at least, and that is large. actually because of the section that we've been discussing extensively today which is the ability to um, of the government to exempt itself uh, from the provisions of the bill which therefore will then leave a certain processing of data completely unchecked so that i think is one of the main reasons why we wouldn't and other than that i think data localization may have an impact and also uh, a, a slightly smaller point but storage limitation because here um, under the bill uh, strangely while you do have to store data only for as long as it is required for the purpose you can continue to store it longer for uh, when you have explicit consent 
So I think that um, these three factors, and of course, sorry, most importantly, also the independence of the authority that is going to enforce the provisions of the bill, uh, given that the latest version of the bill now changes the manner in which the um, DPA will be appointed and uh, the selection committee. I think those are some of the key factors why we are probably not going to be able to meet the adequacy test. Right. Uh, so the second question is... Yeah, I mean, so uh, Aditi, one point I would like to raise is, I mean, uh, for for a lot of the discussions it is given i mean we take adequacy as a given as in this is a part that we want to continue uh, i think uh, some i think uh, I, I don't remember if it's jotsna the report from eu gdpr has come out the commission has published the report right so uh, they i mean it's a model that the commission and eu they have pushed for uh, and they themselves know the limitations of adequacy so uh, that is something that we still need to consider that is this the best model that we uh, adopt to the extent we adopt the model, yes, I mean, a lot of the comments that we give is valid, but that rethink uh, is still something we as BSA are pushing for. But uh, yeah, I thought, let me just flag that. Okay, uh, Josna, would you respond to that? Yeah, no, so I think that, I mean, even if um, the bill recognizes adequacy as one of the grounds as cross-border transfer, as it is recognized in the GDPR, what it does is it couples it with consent. So I don't know what then the benefit of having uh, this sort of a assessment gives if you anyway have to go back and ultimately you are processing it on the basis of consent. And, and uh, I don't see, I, I think that there is still some benefit in sort of mapping whether our framework meets that requirement because those principles are core and important. Uh, and if it is going to keep things in check, such as the government's uh, unchecked access to data, then it's important to look at in terms of a framework to see if, if there is something that we can do that will make us globally recognized as a jurisdiction to which data can be transferred without um, any hindrances in that sense. Right. Uh, my second question is for Anjali. Uh, and how would a telco perform age verification? Because that's a constraint for every data fiduciary under the bill. What verification, sorry? Verification. So age gating, age gating. Age related. Uh, uh, that's there. a very good question. Um, so far, of course, nobody has had to do it. Uh, uh, I think our issue on age verification would be that you just lay down the end objective. Ideally, uh, you should bring the age down from uh, 18 to 16, given the you know digital adoption amongst the youth. Uh, but allow each uh, operator really to devise their own ways and means. So don't do it by way of a mandate, that this is how it has to be done and that's the only way. Technology tools, assessing of data, uh, there is a whole gamut of things that need to be considered, you know? So uh, I can't straight upfront answer how it will be done, but uh, we haven't done it so far. We'll have to figure it out. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Chandrasekhar has to leave in another five minutes. So, sir, if you have any uh, final comments before you go. Uh, nothing great uh, discussion. Uh, any questions you want to throw at me, uh, I can quickly answer. I was uh, actually wondering about how would a big company like Microsoft execute uh, age verification? Because that seems to... Yeah, be so, essentially, throughout the world, it is uh, either parental consent or if a person is an... Uh, is beyond a certain age, then it would be that person's consent. So I have prepared a note on this. Actually, the age of 18 is uh, very high uh, because uh, probably, you know, different laws look at the age of majority in different ways. So one is the law at which the age at which you can get married, the age at which you can vote the age at which you can uh, be considered as a juvenile. So uh, what our lawmakers have thought of is only from the age of consent of uh, for seeing pornography and stuff like that. They have looked at it from that perspective. But today uh, in internet, all the school classes, uh, e-learning, uh, people start, uh, children start accessing the internet from very young age. So if they have a consent at a very high age, like 18, it will become quite nightmarish uh, to actually properly comply with the law. And there would be widespread uh, disregard for the law. 
so uh, we have recommended uh, to meenakshi lekhi that it should be brought down because in our discussions with her she was uh, think she internet means they were thinking access to uh, the content undesirable content content and so for them to bring the age below 18 was something unthinkable so when we gave them this angle about school children and covid and the need for younger children to also access and the problem of getting the consent every time you make it so strict so then nobody is going to follow the law then you might as well not have it so i think they might uh, take a relook at it and any last question yeah i mean my last question for the session before we open up the floor was to be was going to be to venkatesh that how can a cloud service provider or a telco establish retention data retention periods especially because copies of data uh, stored across the world often how do you ensure that it's deleted simultaneously yeah i mean uh, so i think you end with the trickiest possible question uh, this is something we've uh, internally also brainstormed and this came up in multiple discussions with uh, uh, shri krishna committee and afterwards as well so there i'll start with saying i have no answer for this because this is the exact answer uh, question that has been asked uh, in uh, in multiple rounds in gdpr as well saying uh, i mean just to be candid the question that gdpr always asked uh, some of the uh, companies i represent is uh, how how i mean are data controllers being let go right so i think that's kind of the question that comes up and the the uh, the solution the what data controllers keep sharing is hey you know the data is stored in different jurisdictions and if you are going to ask i mean if the process uh, the uh, are, are, sorry our data processes um, being given a lighter hand and data processes are storing all of this in different jurisdictions uh, we cannot function on just a, a, an immediate note from a data controller that all data needs to be immediately deleted and nothing will be there right so so even for this uh, as we, you have different jurisdictions i mean one of the common problem is different jurisdictions have different storage periods as well so uh, currently what we would propose for this is harmonization and alignment so if the indian law is similar to that of gdpr and if the gdpr is similar to that of other laws what you would have is some sort of a consistent global framework of course there will be local nuances to it uh, i mean there could be a state level variation so what you're seeing in california is different uh, from say what you would see in another state but uh, with something like this something as sensitive which also impinges on consumer rights it would be have good to have some consistency on all retention laws uh, sectorally it can change so for example the financial sector will have different norms and then the health sector will have different norms that is totally understandable in some cases but uh, this again points to the need that you need to have global standards when it comes to key provisions that impacts consumer rights so that's how i would look at it so i'm i'm going to pose the same question to uh, to udbhav and tarun uh, udbhav do you want to comment on this uh, sorry would you mind just repeating the, the specific aspect you like me to respond to aditi Yes. Uh, so the question was that how do you ensure data retention periods? Uh, how do cloud service providers delete data when copies of data are stored across jurisdictions? Uh, I mean, I think there are two answers to that question. The first one is at least currently most cloud service providers tend to find uh, provide fairly centralized data management dashboards where you can. when you like store a copy of data including wherever it's backed up or wherever its copies may be present they do allow the provision that you can assign uh, like ascribe a lifetime to the data after which the data is automatically deleted or when certain sort of program programmatic logical actions take place the data sort of is deleted as well so for example if someone deletes an account all associated data with that account is deleted and you don't have to manually go and do that each and every time so that's one way to do it the second way uh, which doesn't really have too much to do in in a world where data localization is not ubiquitous but in a world where data localization is a lot more common i think that at the end of the day it's mostly going to be something that individuals or corporations will have to decide on a sort of per data set or per, per user depending on which country they are from perspective because it's possible that the data retention requirements say in india will be different from the data requirement data retention requirements in america right where say in america you need to store a piece of data for 90 days but in india say it's 180 so even if when someone deletes an account 
you need to now retain that data for different periods of time. And more often than not, cloud service providers or third-party companies provide plugins or services that actually automate a lot of this for you. So you can literally select on a drop-down box that the data sets coming from this account are from, say, India, and it will automatically apply the data retention logic to that. So it's a combination of some manual intervention and also automated solutions. So just to complicate this... Well, so, 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 so one solution might be what uh, India has done in its submission to the OEWG, right? Uh, which is uh, basically about uh, uh, saying that, that, that they want sovereignty to extend to data being stored anywhere in, in the world. Um, sorry, I, I, I think Jotsna has to leave. Jotsna, would you have any uh, comments before you leave? Any, any particular concerns or you know, that no, you want I to don't. highlight? No, Nikhil, and I, I don't want to sort of uh, disrupt the flow that's going on now. But thank you so much for having me on. I'm sorry, I have a call at 4.30, uh, so I have to drop off. Uh, but thank you very much, and it was great being part of this discussion. Thanks, Jotan. Uh, so, uh, so, so Siddharth has put in a bunch of questions. Uh, Siddharth, do you want to unmute yourself and ask some questions? Siddharth? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, great. Uh, so um, I think uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, uh, this was actually uh, for uh, Jotsna, but I think she's left now. Uh, but this is to all panelists now, which is, would it be fair to suggest that a strict reading of Section 35 of the bill would allow exemptions to all personal data except sensitive personal data since SPDI is defined specifically under the bill? So to, So would it be fair to suggest that SPDI, uh, this exemption does not uh, apply to sensitive personal data. Can I take that? Yeah, yeah, Nikhil. It it wouldn't because you know SPI is a is a subset of personal data which is even uh, you know regulated even uh, at a higher level. So the thirty five exemption would apply to any PI, any personal data it should apply. So um, it will apply to both sensitive personal data and personal data. All right, that answers my question. Thank so you. That you have some other questions as well, no? Uh, right, right. Um, so ask the way. So you want to right. double check? <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I was wondering what kind of liability would accrue on telcos if. Um, age verification processes are sort of bypassed by data principles using uh, virtual private networks. This, I mean, if it could be answered one at a time, it will be great. So that just... Okay. <laughs> That's a tricky question. Sorry, uh, age verification bypassed by telcos? No, no. Uh, uh, his question is that if, let's say, uh, someone bypasses age verification requirements, by using a VPN. I, I don't think that has been envisioned. <laughs> Nobody's yeah, even I, thought I, of that so far. <laughs> Look, I, can, can I just, can I just uh, come in here? I mean, a great you know, question. So this is a question that I, I know I, I had earlier as well. Right? I mean, when you talk about age verification by the telcos, right? the one instance or one uh, place where I can think of an age verification is when someone takes a SIM or a landline connection, right? That's the only place where I can think of a telco doing a age verification, or am I completely mistaken? Are there other places where you need to do that? No, so just to uh, broaden the question, if you could also think of intermediaries generally and not, or, or like, let's say with respect to certain yeah, applications yeah. that uh, could be as services rendered subsequently perhaps, which may require age verification at that moment, if I'm not wrong. Fair enough, fair enough. So I think so uh, to answer the first query, which is telco. So I think it's there is a clear defined process by the DOT, which includes uh, what's known as the DKYC mechanism, a digital KYC mechanism, which requires your live photo, which requires your proof of identity, which is Aadhaar or some other card, and then it, then can you get a, uh, um, a you know telecom connection. So which means they don't work as well. Yeah, uh, it's very difficult to bypass that. To answer your second query, which is a much more uh, broader aspect per se, uh, you know, I, like I said, it's it's uh, I really haven't thought through this. Probably we can connect offline and and uh, we can try and come up with the answers on on the liability per se. 
uh, just like a sort of just super short response on that though but like i think intermediary liability would continue to apply to entities like telcos so if like if i say it's just like if i carry out an illegal act using end to end encryption it doesn't mean the telco or the intermediary is liable for it if i bypass age verification using a vpn i don't think the telco or the intermediary responsible for enforcing that age verification should be liable for it at least currently under india's intermediary liability regime Uh, I just, just had one more question. Uh, yeah, after you, please. No, no, I'm just trying to wonder. Age verification is done so that there is a higher level of protection of the data of children. I think that is the intention, correct? Uh, and therefore, uh, when you talk about a VPN being set up, I'm not too sure how the two are connecting up. I mean, who's trying to bypass what and with what purpose? Unless we're talking about uh, maybe like viewing inappropriate content, you know, because that is something that you do try and, uh, you know, create awareness about uh, with parental controls. But uh, beyond that, I don't understand what the VPN question and issue would be. So I think what uh, Tab was probably trying to get at is, look, uh, I am, I'm using a VPN. I'm underage. I'm under 18 and I'm... Uh, using VPN to connect to, um, um, let's say, um, uh, access content on Netflix, whereas I am actually 16 or you know, whatever, where I'm not supposed to do or even I'm not even supposed to enter into a contract with Netflix for that matter. So I think the one thing is, you know, the premise on which my contract with Netflix uh, is sort of invalidated because of the fact that the contract itself will say that you need to be 18 and whatnot. To enter into it, so it's a void contract to sort of start with. And uh, um, um, Urpal just mentioned about the intermediary liability aspect. Uh, the only other question that may come up is what will happen to the data that has been collected? Because you know you technically need to treat the data as a guardian data fiduciary, um, but you would not have because relying on a representation from the user, you have uh, collected the data and processed like a major's data, uh, uh, someone over an adult's data. Instead of a uh, instead of treating it like a minor's data. Yes, yeah, so liability can't be attached in such a case. Yeah, I would I would I would think think so too. But I think we probably need to uh, dive a bit deeper and figure out what are the best practices that one could approach on take on that situation. Thank you. That answers my question. Thanks, uh, Udbhav, you wanted to um, make a point about something. Yeah, uh, thanks, Nikhil. Uh, so this, I, I just wanted, and like it's been dis like brought up in the conversation before, generally about uh, Nikhil, I'm signing off now. I need to get on to something else. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Anjali, uh, for being here. And thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you so Thank you. Bye bye. So, Nikhil, I'm also making a move. Uh, thanks, Frankie. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the participants as well. Thanks. 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 So this is now just a, just a uh, conversation from people who are geeky about this. Anyone who wants to join in, please just raise your hand, and uh, Arun can bring you in. Uh, Yeah, so just super quickly, uh, like I, I just think that other things like people may want to leave uh, is about, uh, it, it's been brought up in the discussion before, but I think that when it comes to B2B providers, one of the sort of least discussed aspects of the bill is certainly this argument around how the government has the power to exempt certain B2B providers who process data of foreign individuals in the territory of India from any aspect of the bill. Because uh, when it comes to even conversations like adequacy, it's a very dangerous provision because what it says is that we have a data protection law and we will get adequacy for processing foreign data, but we can also not apply any part of this data protection law to any data that is of a foreign entity and is therefore not of Indian. So I think that there are certain aspects of uh, the BPO and the outsourcing industry in India that have like that are for that provision. But I think if you look at it holistically, the harms of that provision are, are far outweigh any of its real possible benefits because I fail to see if that is a part of the main law, how somebody like the European Commission or any other country that may want to gain adequacy with us or certify us in any other way would ever be okay with that. So uh, I, I think it's okay for the 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 principle behind that provision to be present in the law, but I definitely think that the extremely wide leeway that is currently given to the government to completely decide how to exempt any foreign entity from any part of this bill applying when it's 
when it's about non-Indian citizen data, it really needs to be re-looked at. So whether there's a sort of separate guidance issued by the DPA around it, whether uh, there's a specific set of regulations that need to be followed by these exempt entities, I think those are sort of like more detailed questions. But it, uh, like I think if alongside the government exception, that's probably the second biggest barrier uh, to uh, to gaining adequacy, not only under the GDPR, but any like sort of self-respecting data protection regime. So I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was discussed, but not in as much detail. Uh, thanks, Adolza. Uh, so this sort of brings us to the close of the public part of the discussion. I think all of us want to just stay on and chat. Maybe people have questions or queries. Uh, but uh, thank you all for on the live stream for being here. Uh, thanks to Microsoft and Google for supporting this discussion. I think it's an important point, and we had a fairly deep dive into uh, how cloud uh, service providers and telecom service providers get impacted. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um.